Welcome back. We hope you have learned some safety tips and procedures so far. In this next scenario, we will look at how the panelists recommend handling a loss of control scenario that involves loss of a primary or secondary flight control. You will want to hear their advice on this one. The Beach 35 was cruising at 7,500 feet when the pilot noticed the aircraft drifting off to the right. The pilot corrected by rolling the aircraft to the left. He then felt something break and the aircraft began rolling to the right. The pilot twisted the control yoke to the left until the yoke was almost upside down, but the aircraft continued to roll to the right into a progressively steeper, spiraling descent. The pilot advised air traffic control that he had an aileron control problem and that he would attempt to land. He applied left rudder, reduced the power, lowered the landing gear, and eventually executed a flaps-up landing without further incident. On the ground, the pilot confirmed that the right aileron was spring-loaded to the full-up position due to an aileron control terminal failure. So, Steve, could anything have been done during the pre-flight that would have prevented this near accident? Katrina, to my knowledge, Beechcraft has no safety bulletins addressing this type of failure. However, pilots can conduct research on a number of websites to look for safety-related documents that, then, that may affect their aircraft. You can get information like this from the NTSB, aircraft manufacturers, and the FA websites. So how do you know about and access these types of resources? For me, it has come from years of maintaining and inspecting general aviation aircraft. More often than not, you will find items that will put you at risk that are not currently addressed in airworthiness directives, and in some cases, service bulletins. We have put together information on all these resources in our upcoming advanced pre-flight program that will teach pilots how to conduct their own records reviews along with other safety data searches. So where can pilots learn more about and access some of these resources right now? There is a lot of valuable information on the internet. However, always confirm the information is from a reliable source such as product manufacturers, websites, type clubs, and other entities. You can also sign up for notifications for much of this information on FA.gov and FAASafety.gov. More of these resources are also listed on the safety stand down handout available online at your seminar location. Well, that is certainly valuable information, Steve. We will provide links to those sites at the end of this program. In terms of aeronautical decision making, it doesn't seem as if this pilot could have done anything differently before the aileron cables felt. Janine, what did this pilot do once the cables failed? The first thing he did right was, of course, manage his surprise reaction to this unexpected event. This is a good case to study because the pilot was able to maintain control of his aircraft even though he did not know exactly what had happened. Pilots can find themselves with no other choice but to use alternate control strategies to maintain control and ultimately land the plane. This pilot exhibited excellent workload management skills by paying attention to the task at hand and managing the remaining flight controls. He obviously maintained his command of the situation and did not stop trying to keep the flight path where it needed to be. A thorough knowledge of his aircraft and basic aerodynamics improved his abilities to handle an unexpected and novel situation. I use a scenario similar to this during training and often simulate a flight control failure on practical tests. If you expose yourself to the possibilities of flight control malfunctions and practice under controlled conditions, it will help build your skills and confidence. Well, that sounds like good advice. So, Rich, do you teach pilots how to handle scenarios like this in your training? Yes. In fact, I spend one lesson reviewing slips, slipping turns, stalls and slips, and slips to land with trainees. In a subsequent lesson, we apply what was reviewed specifically to simulated stuck aileron and rudder scenarios. We perform one series each of stuck ailerons and stuck rudder. While the trainees are banking the aircraft, I'll call failure as I freeze the control in place and the trainees respond with corrective slip inputs. We then perform a series where I don't announce the failure, so it could be aileron or rudder. In this series, it's up to the trainees to diagnose and react to the situation. With stuck ailerons, rudder, or split flaps, I advocate a two-step recovery process. So what exactly do you recommend for the recovery process? First, apply some forward elevator pressure to reduce the angle of attack and increase the margin to the stall. 
Second, apply the remaining functioning control, rudder or aileron, to stop the uncommanded deviation caused by the jammed control and stabilize the aircraft in a straight slip. From there, we could use slipping turns to change heading and route to landing. I also incorporate two different elevator failure scenarios. In the practice area, a simulated stuck elevator during a VX climb and a disconnected or floating elevator. With the stuck elevator during the VX climb, the first action is to reduce power to the slow flight power setting. If power is not reduced in this scenario, the slipstream can drive the aircraft either into a descent, even with full power in a nose up climb attitude, or worse, into a departure stall. After some mild pitch oscillations, the power reduction will result in stabilized level slow flight. In the floating elevator scenario, trainees practice controlling the aircraft by changing power and trim settings. If the conditions are conducive to it, I will have trainees return to the airport, fly the entire traffic pattern, and land without ever touching the elevator control. Excellent. Each of you have given us some excellent pointers regarding this near accident and how we can apply the layers of defense to be prepared and not surprised in flight. In this particular scenario, each of you have really emphasized the value of training and preparation using available courses and simulated scenarios. At the end of the program, we will list resources to help all of us further our education as we build defenses against loss of control. We'll be back after a short commercial break 